Okay, so thank you for coming. My name is Elisa Monjadas, and I'm with JP Marketing. And tonight is all about the creative process. We took six areas from the creative industry, and we've asked some of our friends and colleagues to speak about how they go about a uh, blank from how they go from a blank piece of paper to a finished creative product so uh first i would like to thank cmac our host for being here everyone give cmac a hand <laughs> cmac stands for community media access collaborative and this is their amazing space uh, for the break maybe if you're lucky brian over there will give you a tour it's so it's so incredible it's basically a place where you can it it's to give people who don't have a voice a voice so you can learn everything you need to learn about video production use their equipment and have it aired on the cmac channels it's really an incredible uh, space that they have for the community our other sponsors are Alpha Graphics, Kelly Paper, 110, and JP Marketing. So with all that said, we are going to get started. Let me get out my introduction. Oh, and by the way, we do have a bar. So I've been doing all this research on the creative process, and apparently the most fruitful insights come from a relaxed mind. So if you need fruitful insights, we've ha provided a place for you. And uh, they'll be here all night. Okay, so our first speaker is Julie Grav Gavrilis aka Jules, and forever, for over 20 years, Julie has worked in corporate agency, nonprofit, and entrepreneurial environments. This unique background, paired with a bias towards genuine results, keeps her in constant demand. Now, I, when I read Jules's bio, the most interesting thing, she's done all these crazy projects. She's a copywriter, project manager, but one of my favorite things in her bio was a book that was actually published when she was in third grade called Joe and the Pigeon. And apparently she's been working on her second book ever since. So come on up, Jules. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, so. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, nothing like driving in from the Bay Area and then going first. <laughs> so that would be great. Um, but uh, appreciate all of you guys uh, coming to this. Um, John asked me to, uh, John and Lisa have asked me to talk a little bit about copywriting and then also uh, because I do a lot of overall project management to just kind of blend that with, with some project management. So um, I'm just going to go over a couple of, of, of quick things um, as far as what I always think of when I'm, when I'm writing copy and, and, and working on copy projects as well as overall. None of this is really going to be rocket science or none of it is, is you know, really mind-bending stuff, but it's the, the, the types of things that, that I think about um, all along as I, as I go through. Um, I'll kind of blast through some of this stuff, but feel free to stop me if you have any questions or, or anything like that. Um, first of all, I just want, this is the, the home page of, of the site that, that I have. Um, worked on this together with, with uh, John Milley and the 110 group, and we're all really proud of this site. We, we had a lot of fun working on this, and I'll actually reference this on one of the, one of the points that, uh, that I talk about here. Um, but essentially, just kind of wanted to take you through kind of what I consider the, the five main points to, to successful copywriting. And again, nothing earth-shattering here, but it really makes a difference to, to think through these things. 
The, the first is from both copywriting perspectives and, uh, and overall project management is to really know your client and their audience. This might seem like a duh kind of a thing, but particularly from a copywriting perspective where you're representing the voice of, of a company and the voice of a business, it's really important to, to get in there and dig in. So I always recommend it being, having the copywriter present in any meeting, whether it's just a kickoff or even a pitch meeting, to really get a sense for who this company is and who their, their clients are and their audiences are so that you can really be very relevant with the messages that you're developing, whether it's web copy, something short and sweet like an ad, or something where you're writing a white paper or something like that. So it's, it's just really important there. The other one, again, which is kind of a no-brainer, but it's amazing the, the, the level of, of creative that comes out when you really collaborate, when all elements of, of the, the, the creative team come together and, and collaborate together. Because uh, there will be many times whether, where I'm working with the design team, where I'm, I'm working with other groups, where they may come to me with an image or something like that and say, hey, we need something to really go with this image. Or likewise, I may come up with a headline or with, with some titles that will totally take the design a different way. Um, and in fact, my, this website is a perfect example of that. I remember when I was working with John and his team on, on the website, at first we were just kind of thinking of, of some, some ways to do a marketing site that was a little bit different. Um, but then a friend of mine actually did these illustrations completely separate from what John was doing. And John saw these illustrations is like, wow, I need to change this design completely based on, on the illustration. And so he really took it in a completely different direction. And it was all based on really essentially five different creative people in different states working together on this one little pissant site. <laughs> but it was great as far as the, the amount of collaboration and then the final result that, that came out of that. Um, the, the third piece here, which is sometimes tough for copywriters and any creative for the, for the most part, is to, to really not fall in love with your first draft. So many times we come up with things like, oh, this is great. I'm ready to present this. This is the best thing ever. And then the client will come back, oh, it's not quite there. It's not quite what we're looking for. And it's, it's really important to kind of put that pride aside. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a point where you fight for something and you really push for something that you think is really valuable. But there's also, again, going back to that, that first point of knowing your client and your audience and making sure that, that what you're delivering for them is hitting the mark for them. Not necessarily for you, but you're still infusing all of your, your creative juices and, and, and smarts there to make sure that you can blend something um, that, that works well for them. And that kind of goes into this, this fourth point where as a copywriter and as an overall creative, whether it's video or, or, or design or whatever, you want to push that envelope. You want it to, to deliver something that's cutting edge that's really going to make a difference and that's, that is fun and interesting for a client, whether it's a doctor's office or, or Apple. You, know, you, you want to have some fun with it. But again, you, you, know that you have to remember that it's their business and not yours. I, I, I learned this kind of the hard way when I was on the client side, I was working with an agency and, and, and we were putting together what we thought was a really cutting edge ad campaign. And the agency was really pushing for this one particular image that was a little risque. And the client was very uh, apprehensive about using it. And, and the agency kept pushing, no, we have to use this, we have to use this, we have to use this. And finally, the, the CEO gets on the phone and says, well, you can use that image if you like, but you'll be using it for a different client. <laughs> so it was one of those kind of aha moments where it's like, if you want to keep moving and you want to keep in business, there does come a point where you need to just kind of back off a little bit. And, and again, still be creative, but just remember that this is, this is a client's business that, uh, that we're talking about here. Um, and, and the last point is, I've written copy for all types of, of elements, from high tech to consumer to sports and everything. And it's, it's always amazing how just a little bit of humor, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, can really make a difference in, in the overall messaging. And it doesn't need to be forced, meaning you don't have to try to make something funny necessarily. But particularly when you're trying to, to really get to a point where you're speaking the audience's language. And, and humor can help with that to, to, to really get that sense of, ah, they get me. They understand me. They really, they really get where I'm coming from. And that's where, where a little bit of, of humor can come in. Um, so uh, just to kind of show you the way I work through some of these, I'm going to show you just a couple of, of examples. It's not, not that many. And again, you know, feel free to, to stop or ask questions or anything like that. Um, this first project is actually one that I worked on with, with John in 110 um, for Pride staff. And this is an example of really understanding the, uh, the audience and the client. 
this is all about HR and, and job seeking and such. And, and this was a pretty big website. I think it was what, like 60, 70 pages. I mean, this was a very large website. But the point that we wanted to make right off the bat from the home page is that HR and recruiting is often something in that in the, from a corporate environment is kind of in the back, back wings. It's back of house. It's not something that's very sexy. But for the people who do that, it's extremely sexy. This is what they do, and they feel like what they do is extremely important. So this headline, as a matter of fact, it is rocket science, and then the way that we built the, the copy out for the rest of the site was really to prop these people up. Um, and it made them, both the client and their audience, feel, feel very important, as they always do, but it really it kind of raised the level of, of, of importance and overall, um, uh, just, just the, again, just the level of importance of, of the client. Um, so it was met really well with the, from the client it, it, it's, as well, and then it's also, this, I believe, John, this site has won some awards in that arena um, as well with regard to, again, just really speaking to the client and to the audience. So this is an example of just kind of how a headline can do that. Um, and then kind of along the same, the same line, um, this was a newer campaign for WD-40 bike, um, WD-40 launched a whole new line of bicycle products late, uh, last year. And their client, their audience for this particular campaign was bike mechanics. And so this was another example of a group of people that is just, oh, they're the bike mechanics. They're the guys that are just kind of working in the back of a, back of a bike shop. They're not all that important. Um, but they really are. And so the whole purpose of this campaign was to really kind of create this superhero out of, out of a bike mechanic. Um, and, uh, and, and again, this was through, I, per, I come from the bike industry from way back when, but also it's just a matter of just really digging in with this client and knowing that market really well and, uh, and, and learning ways to really speak to, to, to the different audience that, that was very, very relevant to them. Thank you. Yeah, we had fun with that one. It was, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, they all wear the aprons and stuff. I'm like, all right, how can we make this really cool and fun? Um, and it, it worked out really well. Um, this next one is, is a, kind of an example of everything that I mentioned, but in particular, the humor um, and understanding where an audience is coming from. In this case, the product here is a breast pump. <laughs> so they're, they're, this could have gone in a lot of different directions. And at first, some of the copy that was, was coming together, I was actually I was working as the, as, with this agency as, as actually the VP of client services, but also helping with some copy. And so I had been able to work with the client very specifically um, in quite in depth before we even got to the creative process. But the point was to, to really think about, I don't know how many people in here are mothers or have had to, to fly with their kids or travel with kids. It's not easy. And so the whole point here was to come up with a headline that would really kind of stop people in their tracks. Plus, if you've ever looked at baby magazines or anything, that's just all the same kind of stuff as you're, as you're going through. And, and so this, this particular ad had a lot of, had a lot of uh, stopping power. Um, but overall, we just we got all kinds of great responses back from others, like, "Oh my God, you heard us! You understand! You know, you, you, you know where we're coming from." So it was a lot of fun to, to put this together and, and to you know the, the photo shoot. We, we did this kind of this kind of very benign uh, image, but then hit it with this really sharp uh, headline and, and worked really well with the overall campaign. Um, this next one is a, is a good example of understanding how far your client can go and then backing off if, uh, if, if, if needed. Um, this is a new company actually, they're a weight loss and, and fitness company that, that's operating out of the Bay Area. They wanted a different type of weight loss message. They didn't want the typical lose weight fast type of a message. Um, they wanted an in your face kind of a message. So. I came at the with this, loved it. The, the CEO fall, fell out of her chair laughing, thought it was really great. She says, but it's going too far. <laughs> um, and, and I fought for it a little bit, but not too much because, I, again, you know, you don't fight too hard. Um, but uh, she's like, I really love this, but I think it's going a little bit too far. Um, and so we went with, with this, which is, <laughs> still has the humor and the fun, but it's backed off just ever so slightly. Um, we're still holding that balls ad in the, in the, in the, the holster for, <laughs> for later use, but this is actually running now, um, and we, we've developed a campaign that's very similar to this using similar imagery and other things like that that, again, have, have this stopping power to the headline, and, and uh, you know, the body copy kind of follows that. 
Um, but utilizing the humor, utilizing you know short, quick sentences, things that, that people understand. Again, if, you're, if you've ever been through a diet or you've ever tried to, to go through stuff like this, sometimes it's like, yeah, you know, you're right. This is, this is the kind of stuff that, that is, is going to hit you in the face. It looks um, like a Big Mac. It, it might have been. I don't know. I pulled that from a stock image. <laughs> Um, that came from a stock image bank somewhere. Um, and and the, the thing here with, with headlines too, that headlines are a great place to be able to insert humor, in, particularly in, in heavy um, copy areas like a website or a white paper or something like that. You can, you can use short and quick and fun headlines, but still if your, your, your body copy is relatively dry, you can still infuse some of that personality through your headlines. And I usually do that quite a bit, um, particularly on websites and larger projects that have a, a lot of copy. So it's a good way to, to, to bring some, uh, again, some, some humor and, and personality to, to a project. Um, but th th those are just a few um, examples that, that I wanted to show you. But you know, overall, with, with copywriting, it's, it's a very collaborative process. It's not just myself or another writer sitting in a room and trying to figure things out. It's, it's to get the best copy, it's, it's really collaborating very, very highly with your client, with your account managers, with your designers and, and, and videographers. I've done video scripts and all types of things. You know, it's, it's just really a very collaborative process and that's the, the I've just found that to be the, the, the way to get some of the best results and the, and the most on target results. I think as creatives, some of the, the worst terms we can ever hear from, back from a client is, well, you didn't quite hear me. You didn't quite hear where, what we were looking for. You didn't quite get there. And what I found is, is to really hear them, you really have to listen to them, and you really have to spend time and, and dig in. And, uh, and they, they really appreciate that, and then also the, the results show at, at the end of it. So that's what I had to share a little bit. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yep. It is, I wouldn't say it's the only way, but it definitely makes a difference, particularly as you're saying, you know, with things that are just, it's, everything is so clogged now, and so many things have been done. Um, and I, but then I'm always surprised there are certain campaigns that I will see that are so far out there, but they've stopped me. And that, that's what I pay attention to, being that, you know, as I'm a creative, I don't know what, what you all pay attention to, but I'm sure we all really watch ads and things like that more so than a lot of other people do. And, and what really gets me sometimes is like, wow, that stopped me. That, that really got, got me to, to listen. And I might not agree with it or I might not like the product, um, but, but, uh, it's kind of crass, but the, the campaign that, that, that really, they're like, oh my God, I can't believe they did that. And, and it came from Kmart of all people was the, the ship my pants. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's really creative. I can't believe it was from Kmart. What a waste of campaign to come from Kmart in a lot of ways. But it was, to me, it was just, it was really creative. Um, and it's like, wow, this is, this is a really funny way and a fun way to take something that's pretty boring and benign, you know, mail order pants <laughs> and turn it into something that's really fun. Yeah? Do you have a formula for when you Hold on really quick. Sorry. Go ahead. Do you have a formula for when you like to push the boundaries or when you like to draw the line? Um, it's not necessarily a formula more so than, than really getting in touch with the client. And that's one of the first things that I will always ask a client is, you know, how far do you want to go? How comfortable are you with, with using humor, uh, with using a little bit of sarcasm, or to, with using you know, what I call smart humor, meaning it's not toilet humor necessarily, um, but you know, how, how far can you push it? And so what I usually will do is I'll start, like I showed you with the, the bowling ball ad, I'll usually start a little, going a little far, or what I would consider going a little far, and then let them back off. I, I always prefer doing it that way rather than the other way around. Um, because sometimes if I feel like I might have hit my limit for how far I can go and they say, well, can you push it a little further, <laughs> then it gets a little harder. Um, so I usually try to go to the boundary and then pull back, if that makes sense. <laughs>
Thank you. All right, so much. no problem. You know, Jules is from the Valley, and uh, one of the reasons why we brought her on was because we needed some female. <laughs> yeah, she, for go Fresno State. She, um, we needed some female uh, representation. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, and I had no idea she was going to talk about breast milk and balls, so. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay, our next speaker is Jared Hardy. And I have a special bio for him as well. Jared is a front-end developer and designer who is passionate about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and combining those technologies to create cutting-edge and performant websites and web pages. He is currently a front-end developer, 110 Design. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Cool. All right. So, um, so this is my talk. Jared Hardy's amazing front end development process. Um, I'm gonna try not to. Um, I'm gonna keep it pretty high level. Uh, I won't talk uh, too in depth. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with um, slides of code and stuff like that. But um, um, I'll just talk about my process. Yeah. So um, I, I really like open source. So if there's any developers in the room, I'm on GitHub. Jay Hardy. Um, if you want to talk about code afterward, hit me up. I'm also on Twitter at Jared Hardy. I mostly post pictures of my daughter and my pets, but sometimes I talk about cool stuff too. So um, yeah, so let's get started. So um, generally uh, what a front-end developer, developer does is we kind of live in this world between design and um, back-end development. So um, we may touch uh, Photoshop, open up files. Uh, we all, must, we all uh, might do uh, back-end templates like PHP, Ruby, uh, Python, um, like that. Uh, and, and then we also build HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and kind of bring websites um, alive. So um, depending on the project or the pro uh, if you're building a website or a web application, you may be doing more um, code. You may be doing more back-end stuff. Um, so it, it just kind of depends on where you're coming from and what you're trying to build and, and the end result and what you're trying to build, uh, what you end up doing. So um, this is pretty much my process. It's pretty straightforward and simple. But um, basically, plan, we implement, we ship, and then we repeat that process um, over and over again um, per project or internally for each process of a project. So what does plan mean? So um, right now, it's, it's pretty a weird state in front-end development and web development in, uh, in general. We have some major browser players. We have Firefox, Safari, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Opera, a bunch of other small ones that are open source that no one uses, but they're out there. Um, we also live in a world where we have uh, iPhones, iPads, Retina MacBook Pros, regular MacBook Pros, iMacs, huge monitors, TVs that display websites. Um, we also have Android devices that come out every week that have different resolution, different size, uh, that you, you just can't know about and how to, and how to develop for. So planning is super important because we have to decide what is our end goal? What are we going to target? Are we going to do responsive, where we try to target everything, and we try to give a, a, a somewhat of an adaptive experience so it works well on a desktop, works well on a phone, works well on a tablet? Um, are we going to just do a straight website where we just kind of just focus for our end goal is just a, a browser? Are we going to just do a mobile site only and then maybe a separate desktop site? Um, so there's just lots of planning to go in, uh, inside. We also um, have to consider if we're going to consume any APIs. So maybe we want to pull in some Facebook or Twitter integration with our application or website. Maybe want to in, um, include Google Maps or uh, some weather data. Um, so what are we going to be consuming um, with this website? Um, and then also, we have to um, just worry about what technologies we're going to use. Are we going to be using um, preprocessors, like CSS preprocessors, that make our job easier? But if you're working with someone else, you may not want to do that. What JavaScript libraries are we going to use to um, implement this across uh, different things? We may use jQuery. We may use underscore. We may use Backbone, Angular. These are, these are different technologies we have to consider per project. Um, so it's just a wild, wild rest right now. It's so young and so 
uh, just out there, it's really hard to know what the best process is. So usually every project you learn, you just do something kind of different. You push the edge a little bit on some things. So you kind of learn a new technique, but then you also just repeat your process over and over again. So you're not shooting yourself in the foot uh, when the deadline comes. So what is, when we're taking about, uh, talking about a project or a web app or a website, what's my normal process? This is what it looks like. Um, we start with markup, we go to style, then we add interactions on top of that. Um, so markup means is basically we're taking HTML, CSS, and um, just light CSS, and maybe some typography, some basic structures, just to get it to a point where we can look at in the browser and have a structure of the website. We're deciding at this point what HTML tags we're going to be using for marking up the design. Or, um, so for the semantic SEO purposes, it makes a big difference. We're using the correct tags for everything. Um, this is also where we just start building the basic skeleton for the website. Generally what I do is I'll take, start at one page, maybe the home page, and maybe uh, say we're doing a, a website that has like 10 pages. We'll start at one page, start at the home page, usually a little different, and then the interior page. We'll just kind of build those out and then start using that structure as a basis for the rest of the website. Um, if it's a web application, and what I mean by web application is more like interactive thing. So maybe, um, I'm trying to think of something that might be a good example of that, but something that's more interactive that does a service. So um, maybe like a Flickr that you may be uh, uh, familiar with, like a Facebook type of thing where you're doing a lot more interaction than just displaying some content for a marketing purpose. Um, so after we have our markup and our structure, basically our skeleton um, set up for our whole site, um, we'll move on to styling our application or website. And basically what we're doing is we're applying a skin to it. And so what we're doing in that stage is Browsing our content, our skeleton that we built, and then building CSS on top of that. So CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets, and, and what that is is a styling language for styling websites. And so uh, we use that stage to basically make our website look good or our application look good, and it gives it its uh, appearance. Um, there's a lot of quirks in there between each browser. So uh, you know, a, a browser like Safari will do something different than something like Chrome, and Internet Explorer is just like a different beast itself. So generally, at this stage, we're not worried too much about that um, inconsistencies. We're just building it so it kind of looks OK everywhere. And um, in the repeat stage, we go back and we fix all that. And then interaction is where we start layering on um, JavaScript and CSS um, interactions. So um, you might have like a modal window that pops up like when you do a form and you fill out some form stuff, and then that form disappears after you hit the Submit button. You may have a little slideshow that goes through um, and shows some pictures. You may click on a picture and make it bigger. Um, you may have some interactions with the menu that are drop downs. Um, stuff you've probably seen across the website. But at this stage, this is where we start doing this. And we do this specifically in this order because it's basically easiest to hardest um, and what takes the, um, the least amount of time at the top and then what takes the most amount of time at the bottom. Um, Interactions are really hard to get right across browsers because it's so, um, they're time consuming, they're processor consuming sometimes, and they're also um, code intensive. So sometimes you have to write a lot of code to get something that looks simple, but it just takes a long time. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of basically when I walk through a project, this is um, top to bottom, um, from home page to interior projects, or interior pages, and um, then you just complete the cycle for every every deliverable, I guess, for each, um, each thing. So ship, what does this mean? Um, in the world of software, we ship stuff, which means we release it to a server to, for testing, we release it to a server for live development and, um, and viewing by the client. Um, we ship iteratively, so say you're working on something that's mission critical, um, code, maybe you're accepting credit card payments from somebody and you need to uh, do this code that's like, if you screw up, you might like piss somebody off because you're taking money from people. And so you'll ship something, and there's services like GitHub and, and other uh, services, Bitbucket, that you can ship code and get it reviewed by your peers or people you develop with, and they can check that off. So that's one version of shipping. Another shipping is maybe deploying to a development server. So you deploy something uh, to test it by you, the client, internally. And then at the end, when you're all said and done, you ship it live. And um, so, that's basically when you're, when you're done with one step. Um, you can either ship a whole project or you can ship iteratively where you're shipping features on and on and then going back and, and fixing them. And so, um, and repeat. So what this step means is that we're starting at one point when we start a website, we have nothing. 
hopefully if you're developing mod in a modern way, you don't have nothing, you're using certain technologies and open source libraries that are helping you get a, um, a startup. There's like stuff like HTML boilerplate, which will give you a basic website, great structure, um, some really modern JavaScript stuff that normalize stuff across all the browsers. You're maybe using a preprocessor like SAS or less um, to help do your CSS and make like, you know, your job way easier. Um, you may be using um, JavaScript technologies like CoffeeScript or Angular or Backbone if you're making web apps that give you just a, a, um, a point to start from that just make your life so much easier. And then so, and then so what we do is when we're, we're developing a project, we'll get all the way down, we'll repeat one stop, and then we get to the bottom. And then so we're starting at a home page, and then we go to an interior page. We're going to reuse our structure that we built on other pages. We're going to reuse our CSS because we're doing modular CSS. We're using classes that can just be applied to broad things. And then we're going to be using um, JavaScript over and again, too. So maybe some of us JavaScript libraries. You may write like a slideshow plugin that you use on one website, and then you use it on the next one that needs a slideshow. Um, you may write a grid framework in CSS that you can just build on this. And then the next project you work on, you use it. You may find some bugs. You go back and you repeat, start, you fix your bugs. And then you, every project you use, it just gets better and better and better and easier and easier and easier. Um, so that's it. I mean, really, I'm not going <laughs> to bore you with code right now, but I could talk about it forever. But um, yeah, that's my, that's my uh, presentation. Thanks. So um, <laughs> good. if you have any questions, uh, you can ask me now. Or, We have time for about two questions. Cool. Oh, OK. Um, I was curious, uh, you, uh, you have your own clients that you uh, do this for a business, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah, we work, yeah. Um, what's like the most top end, high end uh, you know, price of, you know, um, of one that you've done for, uh, for a um, website? Like, what's something like? Really high tech. That what would it cost? Uh, and like client or, or product wise, like I mean, when I was working at Groupon, like we did like like you know stuff on the line that was like millions of dollars. Well, like oh, well, like I'd, I'd want to do something like with video production. Uh huh. You know, put some video stuff on there. Yeah. You know, it really depends. It's so hard to to say. You know, this whole process like you know is intensive and 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 the planning stage is you develop all and you take the client requirements. And, and you figure out the end goal, and, and then you can better, um, you know, uh, assess a, a price for a project. But generally, it's people don't charge enough for websites because it's a lot of work. Right. Um, so it, it's really, really hard, and it's a specialized field that takes a lot of work. And, and it, it is expensive if you want it done right. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Any more hey, questions? Uh, oh. So depending on your answer, this is going to be the two to three part question, all right? Uh -oh. Don't do, do that to you, me, Rodney, man. Come on, dude. Do you, um, Anthony, <laughs> really? <laughs> Anthony, geez. can I ask a question? <laughs> um, do you, uh, do you, have you ever taken a mobile first design approach on a yeah. project? Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. great, great, huh? great. How successful has that been, and how often do you suggest taking that approach for each successive project? Um, I, I really believe, in, and it's probably the way to go in the future. We're, we're working to, um, a stage where mobile devices are going to be taking over uh, desktop browsing. And so um, working from a mobile first perspective, of course, if, if the end goal is to be just a fancy website, like, like a video production website like uh, he was talking about, you know, if, the, if the, the, the money website is going to be the desktop experience, you might want to start with that and then figure out what the mobile experience might be later on if, if there's even one applied. But I mean, really, um, Talking about mobile first is, is just basically where the world's going right now. Um, there's tons of frameworks out there that do that for you. I'm sure you're familiar with them, like Foundation and Bootstrap. In Bootstrap, you know, the biggest, the biggest open source project in the world, like powers 1% of the websites now, um, just went mobile first, right? So, so you can look at what trends are going on. But um, it, it is smart, but it's really hard to get right because, like I said, you know, next week, you know, Mortal will come out with the, I don't know, this, the crazy names, Rage, Droid. 2.0 extra, you know, and it has like a, a resolution between an iPad and an iPhone, and you're never going to get it right perfect for it, but it's it's super smart to start that way um, because clients are going to want it now. Everyone wants a website that works on a mobile phone and an iPad uh, as well as a desktop, and 
and it's hard, you have to set expectations. Realistically, it's hard to deliver the same experience um, and interaction wise, but um, yeah, so that's a, a roundabout answer, but yes, it's, it's really a, a way to go now and probably the, the way of the future for the next couple of years until something else comes along. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So obviously we've definitely chosen some experts in their field. So the next time you see a 13 year old that says I can build your website, you might want to think about Jared's presentation. Uh, do we have any extra chairs available? There's one here and one here. If somebody wants a seat, you can come. This is your time if you do not want to stand in the back. So yeah, so right here where this notepad is, you can sit right there. And then there's one more over here. Anybody want it? Irma, do you want a seat? <laughs> I just thought I'd pick you out. <laughs> There's totally a chair right here, right in there. There's a chair right here. Okay, Vic, why don't you come up and uh, you can hook up your mic while uh, I am introducing you. Oh, and by the way, uh, aside from drinks in the corner, there's also restrooms right outside the door. So we'll uh, listen to Vic and then we'll have a short break after that. So up next is a man who comes from the trenches of advertising. He's known to dive on deadline grenades for his troops. And he is a true guerrilla fighter in the design revolution. Please give up your purple hearts and give him a warm, give a warm but not too loud welcome to Vikan Masoyan. Is this, is it on? Can you hear me? You can? It's, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? yeah? I like this hands-free stuff. This is nice. I feel like Janet Jackson. It's Janet. Jackson, if you're nasty. Do I go up and down with the little arrows? Is that what I do here? Uh, I think you go side to side. All right. Deadline grenades. That's one thing we all have in common. I was thinking of actually showing up in camo this evening, but when you look as Middle Eastern as I do, <laughs> not a good idea. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Vika Masoyan, and I got it. And I am a design whore. I have prostituted my services in and around the San Joaquin for the past 20 years, up until I met the love of my career, JP Marketing. Jane, Jane and Paul literally took me in off the streets. Well, Jane did, bless her soul. Paul was golfing. Today what I'm going to do is talk about brainstorming and illustrating, the process of brainstorming and illustrating. But before I get into that, I'm going to let you in on a little secret I learned in NAM. And that's how to stretch out your right brain. Now this exercise is so you don't pull a creative muscle. It's really simple. Well, it looks simple. All you do is draw a squiggly line and you mirror it. But for some reason, every time I show somebody how to do this, they want to mimic the same shape. This here is incorrect. What you want to do is have it look like an ink blotch, symmetrical. After doing a few short ones, I do a couple long ones. And as you can tell, it's not as accurate towards the, you know, the bottom there. But the more you do, the easier they'll get. Now that we're all stretched out, we're ready to brainstorm. Now, um, brainstorming's not just for the creative team, it's for everybody. Grab the secretary, grab account managers, grab the janitor, uh, children, kids are great to have in on brainstorms. Last couple of uh, freelance gigs I had, my nephews pretty much uh, directed it for me. <laughs> so you have the team inside the conference room and you're, you're, you're brainstorming. 
and uh, you come up with all the typical answers, and it's all downhill from there. This to me is is the funny part. I'm pretty I'm guilty for doing this too. Everyone's on their cell phones, googling this, thesaurusing that, um, and then someone says something stupid, maybe inappropriate, a little dark, but. This is where the magic happens, and it's all uphill from there. And this is where you want to be, is the second hump, because that's where all the good stuff is. And you got to remember to stay silly and have fun with it, up until the critic comes in. <laughs> now, this is, this is one thing you really got to keep in mind. It's kind of like improv, right? Uh, it's always yes and, never no but. So can the critic. And with a good creative director, he'll know how to keep you on the second hump. Illustrations. I always give myself daily, weekly, and even yearly exercises. I recommend getting this book called 642 Things to Draw. Now, you don't have to be an artist to draw a toothbrush, a trumpet, a soccer ball, a racket, but keep practicing and design for stuff you're really passionate about. If you like fast food, then redesign the golden arches. Work on jobs you really want to land, and you will. Work on stuff you're passionate about. A lot like an athlete, it's not made on game day, but how hard they train on the off season. One way or another, it'll pay off. This here is my sketchbook. And uh, this first draft was for Cicada Cantina. It's a restaurant out of Redding, California. And their focal point are the five bars which are located inside the restaurant, two outside in patios. What you need to do at this stage is step away from your computer and make shit, period. You've got to go 100% analog. That means no iPhones. No laptops, no iPads, none of that. No music. Music will take you to a place, and it'll take you from your creative thought. Now, this is the mark they chose. Ironically enough, I'm known to have a drink on the weekends, and this was drawn on a bar napkin. I took a picture of it, sent it to myself, and come Monday morning, I vectorized and stylized it. This is the finished mark. This is the finished logo. When you let something marinate, it'll come to you subconsciously. So usually, the best results come from when you're not trying so hard. Now this here was a two-hour grenade. Thrown in our department by an account manager. She wanted a logo in two hours. <laughs> I didn't have the luxury to spend 113 hours on this project, but uh, since then, it's grown on me. This is the finished mark. It's toured the world. It's gone to England, Italy, Greece, Egypt, India, Thailand, Japan, just to name a few of the places. And that's because it was on Jack Wiggins' plane. Now, Jack Wiggins broke the world record for being the youngest man to fly around the world. And he's a Fresno native. We're really proud of him. The city of Fresno issued Jack a proclamation announcing June 29th to be Jack Wiggins' day but I see it as the day my artwork flew around the world. <laughs> this is the letter H. Now, I'm always creating my own suitcases, designing my own fonts, and this was pitched to a client, and they turned it down. Can you believe that? <laughs> so what I did is archived it and pulled it up for another job. Beverly, Beverly, Beaver Creek, Colorado turned their name into Hell Peak Snow Lodge. This here is the finished mark. And this here is Hell Peak Snow Lodge. Now, I decided not to take any money for the project, but instead I took trade. So now I get one week, everything paid for yearly, timeshare, and it's just the best thing ever. It's like so awesome. Uh, too bad I don't ski. 
And too bad this place doesn't even exist. But this logo was chosen to be published in Logo Lounge Volume 8, which is going to hit the bookstores 2014 of late, I think, spring 2014. So it's a good example for always doing work for yourself, stuff you're passionate about. Just practice. This is my drum set. My neighbors hate me. <laughs> it's not because of the drum set, they just hate me. <laughs> a lot like a football player that'll be forced to take ballet, every creative person should have a different type of creative outlet. Mine's the drums. If drums aren't your thing, buy a guitar, learn a couple chords, write a song. And if music's not your thing, write poetry. Hell, turn that poem into a song. I had a really good friend that used to do that. His name was John Lennon. <laughs> so to recap, stretch out the right vein. That's the squiggly lines. Mirror it like an ink blotch. Get stupid and can the critic. And remember, brainstorming is for everybody. Get, you could get great thoughts and ideas from everybody. And step away from your computer and make shit. Always, <laughs> always go 100% analog. If you want something original, it's got to come from your brain. Thank you very much. My name is Vika Masoyan. Viva la JP. <laughs>
Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I was asked to point out if anyone notices that agenda right there. It was supposed to represent uh, the minutes. That's every dot is every minute, supposedly, if everything ran on track. <laughs> 10 black dots for 10 minutes per speaker, two magenta dots for Melissa, uh, Elisa's intro, and then break time. I know no one's going to get that. <laughs> so, but, but that's an example of how I think. I, I try to put a linear perspective into everything that I do. But in this industry, it, it's very, very difficult. Uh, my partner once asked Is, if there's a way to, to show a process of how you think. And that spawned a three-page report on <laughs> how I like to think. And then that spawned Pecha Kucha, which there, I think there was only one designer in that audience. And that spawned this event. And uh, please give it up to Elisa for doing the bulk of the legwork to get this done. <laughs> This is a very interesting quote from uh, Mr. Churchill. Plans, of, plans are of little importance, but planning is essential. It doesn't matter what you do in life. You may have a plan. It may not work out. But planning it is still very important. And uh, having a plan or a process allows for ideas to flow organically, especially in what we do. And I, I want to talk about not only web design, but my perspective of it, uh, my history with it, how, how it's developed over the past 17 years, how it works for me, and what I try to achieve by using a formula that I've developed for myself. I've been doing this for so long, but I still feel like a kid in a candy store. Every new project is an opportunity to outdo your last. Uh, not only your mistakes, but your, your achievements. And with new technologies coming out every week, it seems, I don't, I don't know why you would not get excited. I started in 1996. Um, I was the 12th designer hired at this firm in Palo Alto, 1185 Design. Within the year, there was 25 designers. And that was 1996. But even though there was 25 designers, there was only two uh, people embracing this new thing called the internet. So uh, this, my friend Dave and I spent hours on hours after work just saying, you know, this, this is going to be big. We've got to learn from this. Also, not, not to put Fresno State down, but all the designers from 11.85 was from RISD, Art Center. Uh, all those other well-known schools. And I just wanted to feel like uh, they're, not into, they're not into this. Let's, let's do something here that uh, no one else is doing right now. And also, you had to deal with, uh, what is it, uh, modems, below the fold stuff, uh, bandwidth issues. So, and standards were still being built during this time. But not only was it being built, but it was being done on the fly. And to be a part of it was, was very exciting. Now, fast forward 17 years. Now we're building, doing responsive websites. And as Jared mentioned, everything is going mobile first, especially in third world countries or Brazil and India and Asia. But I, and like Jared said, I, I still think if you want the best experience, it's the desktop. But there's no reason why you can't carry some of those experiences to all the devices, no matter how they come in through your site. And it's, it's this kind of challenge. Back then, it was bandwidth, below the fold, and uh, image sizes. That got me excited. Now it's, oh, how can we make what we did on the desktop, make it work on the, on the mobile, and also on the tablet. So these are new challenges, but just as exciting back like 1996. Th this is where I work at my office. It's, uh, 
It's a very, very old computer. I gotta get a new one. <laughs> but this is where I really work. Uh, uh, Lane doesn't like me putting on my headphones, but it, it, it puts me above the cloud, above the clouds, above the noise, above the phone rings, and the meetings, and the chit chat. So where I can just really just focus on what I need to do. Because uh, for every mood that you're feeling, there is probably a songs, a, a playlist for you. There, there's, this, uh, there's this constant battle between uh, inspiration and perspiration. But I think a lot of my ideas come from the sh while I'm in the shower, or when I'm just about to wake up, or the hallway from the bathroom to our office. I don't know why, but things just happen. <laughs> so when you have a good idea, and you can see the whole thing in your head, then that means you're going to actually do less work because you can already see it in your head. But if you don't, then you're going to have to do more physical work to, to bring up that idea. But there's also the mood that you're in, and also uh, looming deadlines it can, can offset inspiration and perspiration. And what you're trying to achieve on every project is your vision, because that's what clients came to you for, and their goals, what they want to have met at the very minimum. And where that meet, where those two entities meet is the solution. It's not always balanced. Sometimes you're going to have to give. They say they want pink, give them pink. Sometimes you want uh, a big ass image on the home page, and, <laughs> and if you can sell it, you get a big ass image on the home page. But with every project, it, it, it really, really, the most important thing is the content. If you can get content from the copywriter or uh, an existing website of the client, and they don't have anything, go look at their competitors. And that, if you want to talk about uh, when a client says, oh, we don't need a copywriter. Oh, yeah? Well, we're, just, we're going to pull content for your competitors. And when they see the competitor's content, they're going to hire a copywriter. So once you have the content, and then you're going to have to look at trends, what's happening in the world of uh, user interface design, web design, mobile design, and make sure that you're not doing anything that's uh, not on point or what's, what everybody else is doing. They're, what everybody else is doing is a, is a base to where you should be starting from. It should not be under. It should not be above. That's the base, and then you can, even, you can go off tangent from there. So you take those two elements, and you filter them, and you come up with your at the bottom there are your concepts. That can be half-baked, fully baked, eh, maybe for something from a past project, whatever. Just from those two elements, you filter it into at least, I got six there. So you got, you got your vision based on your uh, concept and your trends. And you stick it through this. What I, this is what I see in my head is this maze and to see if any of these things are going to stick. So what you want to do, oh, you can't see that, but uh, oh yeah, you can. I'm sorry, that's a mistake. What you want to do is go through that maze in your head to make sure that at least some of these are going to become fully developed concepts that you can sell to the client. So you take every single one of them, run it through the maze. Some of them are not going to make it. Some will. Even though they will, doesn't mean that they're going to be good ideas, but there's going to be elements from those that you like that you can take uh, to the ones that did become fully formed. So I'm only good for two concepts. The clients ask for, ask for a third. It's really just a mismatch of the first two, so <laughs> they're not really getting their money's worth. But two solid ideas and a third in your back pocket. Two solid ideas. They have to be solid because if they go with it, either one of them, you better be happy with them. Because if you don't, then that's your bad. <laughs> but that was a very linear approach to how I come, come up with ideas. But if it doesn't happen that way, always go back to the content. Always try to find out new ideas. And a lot of projects on the ones that we worked with Julie, she can say something 
and it just, and it just sparks. And it, it's the words that can bring out the visuals, or in her case, it's the visuals that can bring out the words. And it's really fun to, uh, to uh, come up with ideas together. And the, the end result is, on the left, what you want the client to do is to be excited. But if they're not, you're going to have to go, to the, go back to the drawing board. But for yourself, you want to get excited. And if they are excited, then you're going to repeat that process. But it's also supposed to represent I see. And when you see it, it everything just, just comes out. And then you can explain it better. You can defend it better. And then they can see it and say, oh, I see it. I see your vision. I see that you met our goals. And that's um, my process. have time ooh we have time for two questions for John if anyone has any otherwise um, the entire end is you can he is here for you 110 <laughs>
Uh, the girl to the to his uh, to my right is uh, Rebecca Plevin. She's a writer for uh, KVPR, and she's also written before for uh, Vida en el Valle. So she's just you know just like I use photography to kind of tell some stories. She she uses words, and um, you know I, I thought she would be a perfect fit for that as well. The next two images, uh, the one to the right is Ivan Bas, and he has a very very interesting story. Uh, this gentleman grew up in LA. He came from kind of a broken home, got involved in gangs, got kind of uh, was heading down the wrong path. Uh, fast forward to where he is now, he's graduated, he has a degree. He's, he actually runs a program called The Pink House, which is, um, I think it's an offshoot of, uh, of one of the local uh, organizations here in town, like a, um, a religious organization. Basically what they do is they get individuals to live together in a home in the downtown neighborhood, kind of where they might not have, been, might not have come from. Um, and just kind of introduce them to, uh, you know, different culture, different way of life, and, and the ultimate end result is to have them become a better, um, you know, better, better steward, better person, better overall leader in, uh, in the future. Uh, the girl to the left is Rebecca uh, Europkin, and she is an immigration lawyer. And the, what, what drew me to her was uh, that she's, she's an immigration lawyer, and you really have to care to kind of be in that, that specialized, um, uh, that, that field of law. You know, she helps individuals every day trying, trying to become citizens and trying to, to, to become, you know, to live the, the American dream. So the next series is Valley Fruit. And this, I just actually just did this like two weeks ago. Uh, and this kind of fell on my lap. So I'm actually doing, I'm doing a project for this company. They're an import and exporter of fruit uh, in the Central Valley. And while I was out there, uh, I'm creating a story from them from beginning to end, basically covering all of their, the, you know, from the, when the fruit comes out of, the, uh, out of the trees all the way down to where it ships out to different countries. And, you know, what really kind of drew me to this was I, I grew up, my families are immigrants that came from Mexico City, and, you know, I picked oranges in the winter and I picked grapes in the summer. So as I was out there seeing some of these images, you know, to me, it was just, it really spoke to me. It said, you know, there, there's, I, think, I don't think a lot of people really know or understand where our fruit really comes from and how much you know, hard laborious work is, is involved in bringing a peach or a nectarine or a, or a pear to your table. Um, so see, these are some of the images that I, that I captured all is out there. Um, and that's another thing, too, you, you know, being open to, to, to seeing an opportunity for a project and just taking it. You know, I, you know, the company was not paying me to do stills, they were paying me to do video. But I saw the opportunity to be there, and I said, you know what, this is something that I don't, you know, I'm going to stay a little longer. I'm going to grab some stills. I'm going to do something that I think will be very valuable, you know, um, down the line. So um, the gentleman here he, with a hat, he's just the, the foreman of the group. He's just kind of watching, overseeing them. Uh, over there to the left, he's uh, picking grapes. The next couple images. So um, I, went, I had a chance to go to this, like, super high-tech packing house. You know, when I grew up and I, and I picked, fr you know, fruit, uh, you know, all this stuff was pretty much done out in the, out in the fields or in like a, sh a makeshift little packing shed. This is like state of the art. They have cameras that, that actually can see inside the fruit, that can see if there's any Mars or Nicks on the fruit and it'll drop. And so at the end of, the, at the end of their run, after they get washed and cleaned, uh, the packers, which, uh, which is the lady here to, um, to my left, is she, she ends up with the, the best fruit there. They don't have to sort it or do anything at all. At all. They just put it in a box and then they ship it out. Okay, so I want to talk briefly about a new project that I'm working on um, and just kind of go a, a little bit into depth as far as what my process is for that. So the title of the new project that I'm working on is called A Story of One. So the, the reason or the inspiration behind it is to, to try and share people's stories that maybe might not otherwise be known, um, but, but trying to go a, a little bit deeper than just, yeah, this is a cool story, this is a cool guy, you know, check out, look, look at what he does, but trying to break that layer where I'm coming away, I want to come away with some images that really kind of speak to people's hearts, you know, that, that okay, I, I get who he is, I, I understand who, who this guy is and where he comes from. So uh, the, these series of photos are just, these are portraits that are going to accompany a, a larger set, but um, I just kind of want to, want to go through a little bit of a workflow for, um, for what I do for that. So um, I think a lot of people talked about preparation. You know, being prepared is, is number one, it's key in anything. So preparation for me uh, comes in the form of a storyboard. So uh, storyboard can be, you know, that might be a little scary, but storyboards, are, for me, you'll, you'll laugh when you see mine, but they're literally stick figures. 
um, that just kind of help me visualize what I want the end product to be. So I'll show you a few here. And then I'll show the storyboard, and then right afterwards I'll show the image that I, that I was thinking in my head that I wanted to capture. So this is just simply, you know, I want the person to be standing here looking at these documents, and then some notes for myself. You know, when am I going to use a strobe through the window? I, mean, I want a spot-like effect where I just kind of see the light coming from one, from one area. And then this is a resulting image. So, you know, I kind of, I want to go into, the, into these projects knowing what I, what I want to achieve, what I want to get, um, and, and, end with it, and end with this ultimate, you know, the, the end result. So this is just a second angle, same thing. I just want to go low, um, and I want to have some of these uh, blueprints in the foreground. And same thing with the light and everything there. So another, you know, another image there. And same thing, am I, am I gonna need a speed light? Um, I want a landscape shot down the hallway. Um, I want them to stand you know, there, I wanna have both images in there. So, um, I mean, for me, the big thing is just preparation, being prepared, knowing what it is that you're gonna want to achieve with these. You know, you're, number one, you're kinda taking some people's time um, and you wanna be able to, to, to use it effectively, not just show up on a shoot and just be like, um, I don't know, you know let's, let's, let me look around first, let's see what's going on, so. So this is the, the other image, uh, the resulting image from that. Um, and there's another one sitting on the desk, uh, softbox coming from there. And then the resulting image. And then uh, I think this is the last one, but watching reflections, um, softbox, I want them to stand there. And then the resulting image. So. Another step that I forgot to talk about was also, you know, talking with, with the person who I'm talking about. You know, I want to sit down, I want to talk to them, I don't want to feel them, make them feel at ease, make them, let them know that, number one, why I'm doing this project, why I chose you, get to know them, so that we kind of break this barrier, this wall that, you know, if I just show up on, uh, on the day that I'm supposed to shoot, um, you know, people can, might feel a little timid, they might not, might not be re as responsive to me, so um, that should have been in the beginning. I just threw it in right now because I remembered. Huh? Uh, yeah, this is Matt. He is uh, custom drywall on Twitter, if you guys know who he is, um, or are on Twitter. But his family is a really interesting story. You know, a lot of the images, the, the artwork and stuff is from his mom, and he has a lot of uh, influence in art, and, and, uh, and I, that's why I chose to use a lot of the artwork in there. But, you know, it's a, his, his father created this, started this drywall company, and he's taken it over, and um, it's just a really interesting uh, story. And there's a lot more involved in that, but that's, in a nutshell, that's who he is and, and, uh, and what he's doing. I mean, drywall is, is a pretty, you know, you know, no pun intended, dry subject, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think the second part to this is going out to the field and um, capturing some of the people working and, and creating some of the, 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 the drywall process. So that's it. I hope you guys got a little, a little bit of information from that and hope that will inspire you to kind of go on your own uh, creative projects. keep on moving uh, as our next speakers plural come up this is our last uh, presentation of the evening all right let me turn this mic on for you yeah you can each move around if you want to so Byron Watkins is a creative director of Winsong Productions, and Anthony Taylor is a writer and director at Winsong. And if you can't tell, uh, he is also the bigger of the two and the one who writes bios for presentations. So with, uh, with that said, <laughs> I know, I know. It was my delivery. It was Sorry. a terrible delivery. I, I, Can you Sorry, do that again, please? That was really good. Anthony Taylor is a writer and director at Winsong. He's also the bigger of the two and the one who writes bios for presentations. Still, all right, that's fine. You know, they can't all be winners. Thanks so much. You want to read it again? No, it's all right. All right. Um, so um, that's essentially what we do every day. Um, we're going to talk a little bit. Um, we talked a lot about our process and stuff that we do, and we thought 
Um, when we started to look at process, we're like, you know, this process is probably very similar for a lot of creatives. And we found that uh, a lot of stuff that we do, obviously, people had already talked about. So we decided to take it kind of a slightly different angle. Um, in addition to uh, working at Winsong, uh, Anthony and I also do uh, long form improv uh, with a group called Blimprov. And so um, improvisation and the rules of improvisation actually make a way into the way we write and the way that we create stuff uh, quite a bit. Um, and so we thought we would share uh, some of those pieces, uh, some of the, the uh, kind of the rules of improv and how you can kind of apply those to um, when you're starting to create. Right. Um, it's kind of cool, actually, if you think about uh, improv, something that we were talking about. Um, improv is an art form that you perform for people, but is really just creative process. And uh, we're going to tell you exactly how that works, but first uh, we're going to show you how it works uh, and do a little bit of improv, and then we'll talk about some of the rules and uh, whatnot, like how it all works, and you can see how it's really not magic at all. This is like uh, that really bad uh, reveal magic secrets show, uh, but with improv. Yeah. It's like the same thing. Didn't a magician like shank that guy? Yeah, he I think got he's hurt. Dead. I think he's dead. That's scary. Um, I don't want to get shanked. No. We're not going to get shanked after this, are we? Probably. All right, fair enough. OK. OK, so uh, let's get a suggestion from the audience, a suggestion of anything, anything at all. Calculus. Calculus. <laughs> I didn't study. You, I did not study for this test. You realize this test is really important. Yeah. It's like a eighth or sixteenth. I don't know. I don't do math. I don't, it's like something of our grade. Probably. It's something of our grade. Well, you're not copying my homework this time. So, and you're not going to, I'm not going to share my test because you know what happened last time. Yeah, we got caught. Yeah, we got shanked. Yes. <laughs> we got shanked by another kid who also, you need to tell me when other kids steal your test. That's the problem. Someone else had stolen the test. Then I took it and then we all got caught in this test stealing ring. Really your fault. I the whole thing. It wasn't my fault. Listen, Tommy, I, I need to pass this class because if I don't pass, I can't go to prom. And if I can't go to prom, your sister's not getting laid. <laughs> Do you realize how tense she is? She needs that bad. I'm aware. I'm aware of your sister's tension. Well, then do something about it. I'm trying. So give me the test. And then I can relieve her tension. <laughs> I, Red Lobster. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to say any more about what Seriously? I'm doing. Red, Red Lobster? Yeah. Red Cheddar Lobster. Cheddar Bay Biscuits? What? <laughs> they should call them Panty Dropper Biscuits. <laughs> That's horrible. No, <laughs> she's not. She's not going to. I don't really want to think about her that way. So I'd appreciate it if we just leave the panty talk for her and you. Like, like eating? You don't want to think of her whoa, eating whoa, whoa. biscuits? Eating, stop. The panties, what? the eating, let's just all stop that, please. So, I, so you're going to let me cheat off your test, though? Fine. Yes! Ha <laughs> ha! Nailed it. All right, but. By the way, I'm sleeping with your sister. What? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. um, All right. So that's it. That's the whole thing. Yeah, there it is. Um, so uh, we'll explain all that. But this is a quote from uh, Rick Rubin, who I wrote, really prolific producer guy at the bottom. It's long. I never decide if an idea is good or bad until I try it. So much of what goes into the way things, uh, what? so much of get, what gets in the way of things being good is thinking that we know. And the more that we can remove any baggage we're carrying with us and just be in the moment, use our ears and pay attention to what's happening and just listen to the inner voice that directs us, the better. But it's not the voice in our head, it's a different voice. It's not intellect, it's not a brain function, it's a body function like running from a tiger. And so um, when you uh, step out um, on stage with improv or when you're starting with an idea, um, you're, you, with improv you're always trying to come, you really step out with nothing. Uh, you don't know what you're gonna say, uh, we didn't know you were gonna say calculus and uh, people tend to think when you're done, Gosh, did you guys write that? Now, how um, much did you work out ahead of time? What were like the phrases you knew you were going to use? Or when someone says, how did you know that you were going to call him Tommy? And the answer is, right before I called him Tommy. Like, and, as I was saying it, that's when I knew his name was going to be Tommy. So uh, such a large part of it is really just shutting off your brain and letting, um, listening. And, and so this process is really, um, you would think like, how do you rehearse improv or do these things? And so we're going to take you through some of the kind of the techniques that we use and how we apply those 
uh, to our creative process when we're writing or coming up with a concept. So uh, rule one is yes and, which Vic sort of dropped and completely ruined an April Basically presentation. Basically ruined our whole presentation. Whole thing, Thanks, Vic. Whole thing. Okay. Yeah. But the cool thing is, really, honestly, yes and. Everyone knows yes and. Anyone who's heard like a little bit of improv always says yes and. Anyone, someone says, hey, you guys do improv? Yes and. That's like a, uh, like a, a cue phrase for them or a buzzword. And that's part of it, because yes and is always about agreement. That's what we're always doing on stage. So if, uh, if I had said, uh, you know, I'm going to flunk this test because I didn't study, if he had said, no, you studied last night. I was there with you. What? Like, now all of a sudden, we're not creating reality anymore. We have nothing to talk about because he's denying my action. So now I have to find out, OK, what's he talking about? Like, where, where is this going to go? And so that's not, that's not us working out ahead of time. That's just the simple rule of just agree. But agree, agree and the, the and is kind of the important part. It's this idea that we're going to add something. So I'm going to agree with this idea for now, and then I'm going to add something to it. So if I say uh, we should go to the grocery store, and yeah. then I would say yes, and we should rob a bank on the way there because I have no cash. Um, and so um, I, you're constantly upping the stakes on what that's going to be. I'm going to, I'm going to agree with what you said, and then I'm going to add something to the equation. Um, and it's similar when you're coming with an idea. It's like, what are all these ideas at the table? How can I, we agree with these and potentially add something to them so that we're continuing to create something so that we're not just constantly uh, uh, you know, waiting for something to happen? It's really easy to sometimes say no to an idea because we know better. Oh man, I've made this website or I've made this video or I've made this design a thousand times. I know that's not going to work. And so when someone suggests something, it's really easy sometimes to say, nah, let's do this other thing. And instead, challenging yourself to say yes first, think about the idea, really try it before you then dismiss it out of hand when the person leaves the room can sometimes be really important. I have this, uh, when it, you, uh, with video, you get, a, you get a feedback from the client, and you're like, oh, that's not going to work. I don't even want to try that. Um, but then the thing that I have trouble um, when I'm calling the client is telling them the thing didn't work if I didn't actually try it. So I always go and try it. So that way, when I do call them, and I, it, you know, once I decide it didn't work when I tried it, I at least can uh, tell them honestly that uh, I at least tried it, and I don't think that it works. And then sometimes it does. And so uh, those moments always thwart you where you're like, I just don't think that's going to work. And it's kind of what Rick's talking about, this idea that uh, you know, he doesn't let anything uh, come in the way of trying something new that he doesn't think will work. Well, maybe it will. Let's give it a try. Um, so act as if is kind of the second part of that. And this idea really is like, whatever reality is created on stage, um, I'm going to go with it. We're all going to go with it. So that's what, where it really starts to feel like what we're doing is being written. So if all of a sudden Anthony says we're in space, and I'm the president of the United Sp States, then we're, yes, in sir. we're in space, and I'm the president of the United States, and we're all going to agree that's what this is. And if we all go with it, the audience goes like, how the heck did they know he was going to be the president in space? Because that's just weird. But the point was we didn't. I just agreed that that was the case, and we're just going to act like that's normal. Right. And the, the other option, which is the wrong choice, is uh, we're in space, and now I walk on stage going, huh, OK. Uh, so we're in space. Uh, what happens there? Uh, I have, uh, like, as opposed to just acting as if, yeah, we're in space. So guess what? We can't go outside. Nowhere. Like, just ex act as if that's the truth. That is the truth we are creating here on stage. You know, the truth we created in our scene was I was obviously dating your sister. At no point did he say, no, you're not dating. What? That's crazy. Why would you date my sister? You know, she's 30 years old. Like, you know, no point did it come into like our thought that we would deny each other that action because that gets us nowhere. The scene dies. As soon as you deny something like that, the scene's just dead. You just might as well move on. So uh, it's, in a creative situation, I think sometimes um, act as if for us is just pretending like we actually know what we're talking about. Um, you know, you get into a room, it's just, uh, just sell it. Pretend like uh, you know what the hell is act going on. Act as if you are the experts they hired to be there. Yes, that's all it takes. Um, Hold on to your shit. Um, this one is. Um, he censored it, but I said it. So otherwise, you wouldn't know. You'd be like, hold on to your. What? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, this idea is essentially this: um, to uh, not let go of the thing that you create. So if I um, if I walk out and I say I'm really mad, and then he says, um, don't be mad, um, it's okay, and then I just give up being mad like that then I'm not holding on to what I created in that first moment. So that, whatever I made in that first section, that's what, I, that's what I decided I was going to be. And if I don't hold on to that, then the audience goes, wait a minute, like, what's this character about? And so if I'm angry, then I need to figure out how to stay angry or at least upset. And then Anthony's probably going to try to either figure out why I'm mad or he's going to try to talk me out of being mad. So at a certain point, um, the longer you hold on 
uh, to what you're doing, the more the scene just goes back and forth. And pretty soon someone has to give. But at a certain point, that's how you're making the scene. As long as I'm holding on to what I believe and Anthony's holding on to what he believes, and we keep going back and forth, then we're going to create some kind of conflict as characters. And then eventually, at a certain point, either something's going to happen or somebody's going to give up what they believe for a good reason, and then that's going to what's going to potentially finish the scene. So it's a matter of um, believing in what you start with because you started with nothing. So obviously my brain told me I was angry, so I'm going to hold on to that and I'm going to keep doing that as long as I can. Yeah, we do that creatively all the time because there's lots of times where I hate something and he loves it, and sometimes I can't, I can't articulate right away why I hate it, but to just say to him, I don't know, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Yeah, you like it more than me, so let's do it, is really kind of dishonest to how I feel about it. And, I, and something I talk to, you know, the people we work with too all the time, like doing brainstorming, is like, it's okay to make an emotional response, not just an intellectual one. So like you look at it, it's like that doesn't work intellectually because this cut doesn't work, but it's also okay to have an emotional response to it and say, I don't know why that doesn't work, but it's not working for me, we gotta figure it out. And that's part of hold on to your shit for me is, you know, if I'm having an emotional reaction, like a visceral reaction, like this doesn't work or this story is not being told the right way because of something and I can't articulate it, hold on to it until we can figure out what it is. And then we can have conflict because the conflict is what creates all the really good stuff. Us yelling at each other in our office is the stuff that creates all the good stuff and people coming up. I, just really quick, my first, the first day I worked with him, we got in a really big fight about something. I got really mad because he'd been doing it longer than me and I couldn't articulate why I didn't like it and it really pissed me off. And at the, the argument ended with me saying, I don't know why I don't like it. I have to stop arguing with you because I'm frustrated that I don't have the vocabulary to figure this out. And afterwards, uh, the business manager came to me and she said, I'm really sorry that he talked to you like that and that that conversation got that heated. And I was like, that was like the best conversation of my life to date was this passionate, creative, conflict of like us hating each other about the idea, not personally. It was never personal. I never felt that way. So the conflict is what creates all the good stuff. If we disagree, then it's just one person's idea if everyone's agreeing. I think the other thing too is that um, we like ideas that we can, all of our ideas we try to poke holes into. So like we come up with an idea, we're always trying to figure out like how to poke a hole into it so that to see if it's any good. And like the, if the idea can hold up to all the stuff we throw at it and all the like, if we can't poke any holes in it, or the less holes, or if we poke a hole in it, we can solve the hole, then we know that the idea is really solid. And it's like, so that's part of that process of giving up some of those first ideas that have been talked about tonight, or that, that those elements, um, you, know, sleep, you know, we always sleep on an idea before we do anything with it, uh, wake up the next day and see if we think it's any, any good still. But uh, that process of try, how can we poke holes in this? So it's a process of like, if, if Anthony has an idea and I can poke holes in it, and then he can defend those back to me with solid answers as to why there's solutions to those or why that isn't a good answer, then I'm starting to come around to that idea to realize, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense. And now we've, we're kind of working towards something that we feel like actually works. So, uh, but that comes from the second I say, well, that's stupid because of this. If he just gave up on it at that moment, then we wouldn't have an idea that we're potentially building on. But if he's got a solid reason as to why what I said uh, it does work, or maybe I'm not seeing the whole thing, um, then that's where we're starting to come around to those different pieces as we poke those holes into it. Um, next rule is just listen and react. This is my favorite improv rule because um, uh, inevitably after shows, people always say, oh man, that's really cool that you made that thing up or that you guys made up that you were in like a calculus or you had like, you had like a math test. You made up the test and you made up the fact that uh, you were dating a sister and you made that up. And really, the, this is my favorite rule because improv is just listening and reacting, there's no creation whatsoever. If you're doing it right, you never are thinking anything up or trying to invent anything. It's just me looking at my partner and checking in with his body language and the way he's looking at me, he's looking at me very serious. So this is a very serious moment. Uh, okay, so he's got his hands in his pocket, so he's nervous about something, not sure he wants to tell me. Okay, so that's all, that's all I'm doing is listening to his body language and the things he's saying, I'm just reacting. I'm not thinking, oh, you know what would be really cool? This would be really awesome. If I start the scene and I say that I'm dating a sister, but I'm not going to say that for like another five lines. That would be so funny. Like we don't do that at all. It's always listening, reacting. Listen, react, listen, react. And what that does is when you can make that gestalt shift to get away from creating and just listening to whether it's the client, the project, or whatever, and reacting to the things in, in, in that, you're using your subconscious brain in a really active way, actually. And uh, stuff happens that's just, it's weird, but it's awesome.
I think the thing is too is normally when we're performing, there's four, maybe five or six of us all together, and so people are waiting in the wings. And um, what you're doing is uh, two people are up on stage and they're creating a scene similar to what we were doing. That would have been like one portion of the show, and then uh, the rest of the people are off to the side and we're all listening to what's happening in the scene, and we're listening for the point where the scene is over. Because um, the longer you leave them out, at a certain point the scene's going to die. And there's a, a button on the scene that that's where the scene needs to be wiped in order to finish this in a point that it feels tight and cohesive. So we're off on the side and then what's going to happen is as soon as that happens, if we're paying attention, one of us is going to run in front of those guys and we're going to wipe them off and then start a new scene. Well, what happens is inevitably when you wipe, I'm not sitting on the side making up what I'm going to say next. I'm just listening to what they're going to say. So when I wipe, I've wiped because the scene needed to end, not because I knew what I wanted to say next. So now when I turn around and someone's standing in front of me, I have no idea what's going to come out of my mouth or what's going to come out of their mouth. You're standing there literally blank. And so someone just says something and we start and then we start yes and. We act as if and now we're creating a scene together. And now this is building and then we're going to create something that someone else is going to wipe. And so similar kind of in that process of starting to create something is like, you know, we're constantly trying to maybe solve the problem in a brainstorm. But like if we're just constantly listening to everything that's happening or trying to take in all those pieces and then figure out how they might fit, uh, you know, we can react to how that might work. Uh, you know, better for the process overall. And, the, and, and in relation to video production in general, it's an incredibly collaborative process. You can't do it yourself. You know, you have someone shooting, you have someone producing, you have talent in front of the camera, you got someone doing lights, you have a location, which becomes a character sometimes because it doesn't cooperate. And so being able to listen to all those factors and then react to them as opposed to walk into the environment and go, man, I saw it perfectly in my head, this is the way it's gonna be. Why is that wall red? <laughs> that wall wasn't red before, and so how do you deal with that? And like being open to that and being open to listening and reacting at all times is really important. I, you know, filmmaking is such a collaborative art. It's one of the really only arts you can't do by yourself. You know, you can paint and not show anyone. You can make a song and not have anyone listen. You could design something and never show it to anyone. But uh, with film, you have to let go of things. I've got to get actors that are going to take the words that I've written and make them something else. I have to get a camera guy to shoot for me, and he's going to see it slightly different than what I saw. Or the location's not going to be the, you know, because I had to p not pay for this place, it's going to not be shaped <laughs> the exact way I saw it in my head because I can't build a set for it. So uh, compromise is constantly part of our job. So it's like, okay, here's what we saw. Uh, you know, uh, David Fincher had this quote about how the movie is always perfect right after he finishes reading the script for the first time, and then after that, it's all a series of compromises. Because he's directed in his head, and he's seen everything could be absolutely perfect in his brain for 110 pages, and now I've got to go give this to everyone else, and it's going to be inherently different than what I saw the first time. And that's really that process is always like, how are we, how are we listening and constantly being able to react to what's happening uh, that gets thrown at us? Uh, the last rule that we're going to talk about is just trust your team. Seems really obvious, but part of the stage is uh, when we're on stage, we have these people that are with five of us. We're walking on stage with nothing, and so you're behind, always behind the scenes. The thing I always turn to Anthony, I say to him right before we walk out, is like, are we funny? Do um, we know how to do this? Do we know how to do this? Because you're like, we do? holy crap, we don't know what we're doing. And so uh, you walk out and you just have to trust the people that are around you. I'm going to say something stupid or I'm going to make a bad play, but I know that Anthony's going to justify what I said. I know that my teammate is going to say something back that's going to either make what I said funny or it could potentially be the thing that's like the flower in the whole show that the whole show is based on, like this stupid thing that I said. That's exactly what happens. The one play that you make, man, I was so stupid, I should not have said that. That was a bad play. If you're playing with people you trust and people who trust you and really good teammates, they elevate that thing to becoming the thing that when you talk to people who see multiple shows, they're like, oh yeah, that was the That Thing show. That the thing that I thought was like the stupidest thing I could have possibly said, that becomes the thing that the show's known for. Because we all trust each other and work together to elevate the work. And so I think, especially in a process like filmmaking um, and, and doing commercials, uh, trusting the people that you're working with is so uh, key. Um, I, I'm constantly looking for people now that work for me that are better than me. Uh, like, how do I find someone who's more talented than me? Because it's like, how can I give this to them and they're going to come back with something even better? It's like, if I trust this person to sort of take what I'm giving them, interpret what I'm saying, and then come back with more to the table because they're going to want to put their best into it, then I know that now I can give my best back to them and we can create something that's even better than uh, you know, what we could create alone. And so that trust in the team, I think, is, is really important. I have like four people that I trust implicitly. You know, it's not a very long list that's where it's like I could literally give them something, walk away and come back, and it will be just insanely better than I ever thought it would be. And so finding those people in your life uh, that you can trust to that extent, um, I think, is key and really part of the improv process that's important. You can't do the other four steps if you don't have that either because it feels really icky when you're on stage with someone who's trying to perform for an audience and not really 
within the group and you, you know, they deny an action. Like if I came in and said, hey man, I didn't study for this test. And he said, yeah, you did. I studied with you last night. I don't trust him now. I don't trust him because he denied my action. He said, he basically flipped me off. He said, no, screw you. I don't want to do what you do. I want to do what I'm doing. So now for the rest of the show, the rest of the 30 to 45 minute show, every time I'm in a scene with him now, I'm thinking, how's he going to screw me this time? Great. Okay. Yeah. Whatever you want to do, dude. What scene do you want to do? That's fine. And that's like an awful place to create from, like of like fear and distrust and like insecurity. And so if you trust the people you're working with, you can afford to say yes and to ideas that seem stupid because you know that you're not necessarily committing to following through on them forever. And you can act as if in scenarios because you know everyone's going to back you up. And you can listen and react to what they say because you know that they believe in the same things you believe in. Um, we have nothing to say about that. I just thought it was funny. I made it. And, um, um, but I think... Um, I really, I guess the, the idea is just that when we create, I feel like you're always just giving a part of yourself and you're taking something that is a part of you and trying to share it with someone. And in a way, the improv is that. Uh, you know, we don't know what we're going to say when we walk out. Uh, we don't necessarily know the idea or the script we're going to create. Um, but um, one way um, for the writing process, if you like to write, um, applying these rules that we just talked about to writing, when Anthony and I write short films or we sit down to write a script, uh, we'll sit down and just start improving a scene like that. So instead of staring at a blank page going like, what piece of dialogue should I write? We'll just start doing a scene. So it might just be a word or he just starts yelling at me and I'll just know what he's doing and I'll just start talking back to him. And so we'll spend 10 minutes just doing that back and forth and then we'll stop and we'll go, oh man, that was really funny. And we'll write down like a, a block of the stuff that we really liked and then we'll do it again. And then we'll write down another block and then pretty soon we've got a whole you know, we've got five minutes, ten minutes of material that is a conversation between two people, and we've taken the best stuff out of everything that just was sort of in our subconscious. And, uh, you know, instead of sitting there banging your head against the wall, uh, you're just freeing yourself up to create because you're just allowing yourself to spit what's in your head and not care what it is, and then forming it back together later. And that's really how uh, a, a big process of how we write mm -hmm. and create is just letting that happen and then putting it on the page. What I love about improv as far as the creative process is concerned with the, the the almost irony of it which I really like about talking about it like this is it's a incredibly temporary process you know an improv show once it's done it's done it's never performed again so when you ever you see an improv show that's the only time that show is ever performed no one re-ups that entire no one's written a transcript down no one's memorizing those lines gonna say them again and so to use like a really transient kind of form of like creation to then possibly inform the way we create all these really permanent things like designs and logos and websites and videos and all that kind of stuff is kind of interesting to me that you can use the same processes to create something both completely temporary and ephemeral and also something that lasts potentially forever. Done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Presentation over. Thank you so much. Okay, we actually are a few minutes early, so if we have, we actually, will you guys stick around for a few questions if sure. necessary? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have time yes. for about uh, two to three questions, um, cause we're, and we have some already. So we'll start with sexy voice over here. Yes, oh my gosh. Uh, hey, can you talk really slow? Yeah. Oh my gosh, this guy's so good. Listen to this, watch this. Can you guys turn the bass up when he talks? <laughs> Please? Do it. I don't know what to say to that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you do. Oh. Um. <laughs> you have a cigarette? I don't smoke. <laughs> Yet. My boss is in this room, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say her name, though. Um, on rule two, you said you kind of have to shut your brain off, right? That's also shutting off your internal filter. Can you give us an example of when you said a joke in poor taste and how you recovered from it? Or have you never made a mistake like that? Oh, no, that happens all the time. Um, okay. there, I, I have a great example. I actually have a great example. It's awful. Um, we were, did a show. <laughs> I'll share it. Uh, we did a show at the Review one time, and um, uh, someone who's not in the group anymore, we were in this scene, and the scene got really blue. We try not to work really blue just because we feel like it's too easy. Like, it's really easy to get a laugh from a sex joke or something like that. It's just because we're so repressed that that's just super funny. And so the show had kind of gone that way anyway, and I, and I kind of surrendered to it because um, I'm an attention whore, and like people are laughing. I'm like, yeah, they're laughing. And uh, I ended up in this scene where I was like, I, I had taken Carlos, one of the members, like from behind. I was like hugging and pretending like I was having sex with him, and I felt the audience just go, boo! 
<laughs> shut down. I was like, oh, dang it. That was a mistake. And, I, and the thing is, it ruined me for the rest of the show, too. For the rest of the show, I was off stage. I'm like, I don't know. Should I just come on like as a Boy Scout? I, what do I, how, do I get, how do I get their trust back? Like, I love all people. Everything's fine. So, yeah, it has happened. I mean, there are some times where you do feel like you go too far. But, you know, I, the thing is this, honestly, and, I, and I'm not just saying this, I don't regret it. I mean, it happened, and that's part of the beauty of, like, doing improv is, like, it happened, it'll never happen again. It's not like I put something into the world that's going to live forever, and now everyone is always going to hate me. They're going to know me as the guy who does that. You know, you guys would never have known that if I hadn't just said I probably shouldn't have. But, you know, like, I mean, that is kind of the beauty of, of improv, how it is kind of ephemeral, and it goes away. And so uh, while I am ashamed of it, I don't necessarily regret doing it because it, it, it changed me as a player going forward. I really try and stay away from that stuff because of that experience really kind of, Made me, didn't make me feel good. I think the thing is too, what Anthony was saying, how improv is essentially just process. It's like nobody gets to see that period when you're creating. You know, like the client doesn't see any of the yelling at each other, but that's what, essentially what we're doing on stage. So all of those dumb ideas that you had that you put on the wall, it's like we're just sharing them with you and for $5 for an hour. Well, and we say all the time too, sometimes it's important to get that bad idea out of your head. Like rather than like keep it in and say, well, I'm not going to say that because we're never going to use it. Just say it, speak it eject it from your mind so that it's not banging around in there with the other good ideas. Like, because if I say it and he's like, that's stupid. I'm like, yeah, I know. Just put it on the board. Okay, just, yeah, I know it's dumb. We're not going to use it. But at least now I don't have to think about it anymore. I've ejected it from my brain. It's gone. As, as being, um, you know, filmmakers and writers like yourselves, what is your guys' ultimate goal in this business, in this industry? Make a ton of money. No, uh, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> that's a horrible thing to say. For me, it's not having to fire anyone tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, like, if you're like... <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I... You know, I don't, you know, I used to have those when I was younger. Um, I've given all of those up. Um, my goal now, I think, is just to have fun doing what I'm doing every day. Um, I, I don't have pipe dreams about, like, what anything will be, because I know there's tons of people just like me everywhere. So it's a matter of sort of, obviously, you've got to dream big and want what you want. But at the same point, like, um, you know, I just want to have a good time and I want the people that work with me to have fun creating the stuff that we're creating. So creating a space where we have the ability to say no to something, um, trying to take things that um, alleviate the, the grind of certain things and then, um, you know, in a way you kind of take one for the man and then do one for yourself. So it's like, you know, we'll do a commercial that pays so that we could do a free music video thing for Sahab or, um, you know, what can we do so that we can make a web series that doesn't pay anything. Um, so a lot of that's that, you know, and the stuff that you love to do is all, it's so spec work anyway, especially with video. I mean, it's, you're basically just getting out over your skis because like nobody's paying for it ahead of time. Uh, with commercial work, it pays really well. And, uh, you know, if you keep trying, you can do fun stuff within it. It's not like you're restricted as long as you're pitching or taking the stuff that you really want to do. You know, you can still do fun stuff within that space. Um, it's just a matter of um, being choosy and uh, choosing correctly, I think. So having fun, I think, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I, I really want to, I like telling stories like, re, like really messed up stories. And so I, and like really like challenging stories that challenge people and like, and their, their concepts of what's, what's right and what's wrong. And like, you know, like my theater uh, idols are like Stephen Sondheim and Neil Butte, people who don't write uh, plays that morally judge their characters. You know, and that's why I love shows like Breaking Bad and, and Homeland and Ray Donovan and those things because they don't morally judge their characters. They're just, they are who they are. And so I would love, that, that would be my goal is I get mad that I haven't written anything like that. And so that would be my goal is that I, I someday write something that someone else is mad they didn't write. That'd be pretty <laughs> awesome, you know. Okay, thank you so much. Give them a hand, Winston Production. Okay, we are uh, not done.
because now it's time for you to talk to each other. So uh, there is still there are still drinks. We're going to be here for a while. Thank you so much for coming and uh, buy a drink for a speaker if you really liked them.